And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And this has been pretty much our profile or our, our outline of studying the gifts that Christ has given to the church. Mark Devers made this statement. Intercessory prayer is perhaps the most basic ministry of the elders. In order to speak to men for God, elders must speak to God for men. And then there's one more quote. You as a church member either need to trust your leaders or replace them. But don't say that you acknowledge them and then do and not follow them. Rather than distrusting church leaders, let me encourage you to talk behind your elders' back. Meet in secret. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, meet in secret and plot to encourage your leaders. Strategize to make your the church leaders work not burdensome, but a joy. So we reach the point in our study on the church and the gifts that Christ has given to the church, and we're going to talk tonight a little bit about governments. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, that's the outline we've been following. We've already talked about teachers in the past and miracles and gifts of healing and helps, and tonight we're discussing governments. So when we look at the government, the English word government appears in four verses of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, which I'll go ahead and read. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. It's also recorded in the book of Isaiah in 9 and 7. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, and unto the throne of David, and unto his kingdom, to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth ever, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. It's also mentioned in Isaiah 22, 21, chapter 22 and verse 21. And the Bible reads, And I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And then 2 Peter 2.10. 2 Peter 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible reads, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness, and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are afraid to speak of evil dignities. So those are the four verses that the word government in the singular form are mentioned. The plural form, governments, occur in only one verse of the Bible, and we've already read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, where we find the listings of the uh, uh, offices or the gifts that Christ gave to the church, where it states first apostles, second, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, and gifts of healing, helps, and there it is, governments and diversities of tongues. So when we look at the Greek word used in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 28, because that's where our study is based out of, it comes from the Greek word kubernis, or kubernesis, and it means uh, directorship or government. 
So a government is basically directorship or the people that are directing you in the way to go. And when we look at that Greek word, it is only used one time in the entire New Testament. And it is right there in 1 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28. So as we look at governments in the Bible, and we compare it to today, today's church world that we live in, there's all kinds of leadership positions. And if we would probably try to rank them in our mind's eye, we would probably go something like apostles, or and then pastors, deacons, and teachers. Teachers kind of going right down the chain. So uh, you have your teachers, which are over your Sunday schools or special classes, and then you have your deacons, which are over them. They are basically the council of the church. And then you have the pastor, who is over the deacons. And then some believe that if you have somebody that establishes a church and moves on that they have apostolic authority where they might have control or say in one of the churches that they establish. So then maybe apostles would be at the top. But we don't really see a listing like that in the Bible. We see the gift of apostle and we see those of pastors. And we can kind of get some sense from the apostle Paul and the way that he worked things that we would compare it to. But when we look at church government, really when it comes to an infrastructure, we don't see Sunday school teachers. We don't have your children's church pastor. We don't have your youth pastor. But rather, we see the office of a deacon being created. And why is that being created? Simply because they needed help. And as the church expanded, then other offices got added. There's nothing against it. It doesn't go contrary to the Bible or against it. But really, when we get down to it, we see the ranking of deacons. In Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, Acts 6, 1 through 7, Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7, the Bible states, and in those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out amongst you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer to the ministry of the work. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man of full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicola, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they sent before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So when we're looking at the word of God, besides the gifts that Christ already gave to the church, this is the first office and only office that we really, really see the church or the apostles creating. And when we look at the office of deacon, it was one that was created out of necessity. The whole reason that the office was created was because the Grecians were complaining. The Greeks were complaining. You're doing this and you're doing that, but you're, you're forgetting about our widows. You're forgetting about our shut-ins. Nobody's going to visit them. But the truth of the matter is, for the church decides, how can 12 people go and visit thousands and thousands and take care of thousands and thousands of people? And that is where we are with this early church. So the apostles created the office of deacon to help them in the ministry. So the deacons were supposed to go out and visit the sick. They were supposed to go out in today's night in an hour day and age. They would be the ones to go out and go door to door, knocking on doors, inviting people to church. They would be the ones going to the nursing homes, praying for the sick and visiting those that couldn't get out. If somebody has it, or if they're stuck in their home and they can't travel anywhere, 
the deacons would be the ones to go and visit those people in place of the apostles because the apostles had enough to do. And the reason for this was the apostles said, is enough for us to try to pray and understand the word of God and study it that we may minister unto you. So when we look at the office of deacon, it was created to free up the apostles that they may study the word of God and pray. We find this in Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, where the Bible states, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the apostles created the office of deacons so they may dedicate themselves to studying the word of God and to prayer. And when we look at the office of deacon, it is an extremely important one. We find this in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Where the Bible states, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, or we could translate that a deacon because it was the same thing, he desired a good work. In verse 13, for they that have used the office of a deacon will, will purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the office of deacon was extremely important. In fact, Paul wrote to the individual who has acquired the office of a deacon, they have acquired a very good thing. And when we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we won't read it, but we have instructions for the office of a deacon right then and there. Paul lays right out what is required of a deacon. And when we look at the time of Paul, the office of a deacon was extremely important, as we've already mentioned, and that Paul wrote to Timothy that whoever has obtained the office of a deacon has acquired a very good thing. It wasn't something to be taken lightly, but rather it was a high honor. So when we look at governments in the church, there is nothing wrong with creating an office out of necessity. If someone wants just a title, because there's lots of people in this world, they don't want to do work, but they want a title. And there's a lot of people, in, even in the ministry, they want the title, but they don't want the responsibility that comes with it. If the church has a necessity, of uh, has a need that needs to be met, it's all right for them to create a position and put somebody into it. There's nothing unbiblical about it. But the only office we have listed within the church itself, in the Word of God, is that of a deacon. And then we'll go ahead and stop right here. And that will conclude our lesson on governments. Does anybody have anything they want to say or add at this point? Well, if not, then we'll go ahead and get ready and we'll go ahead and dismiss. So if we would all stand across the auditorium, we'll go ahead and dismiss in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would just give us safe traveling mercies as we travel back to our homes, bring us back safely on Wednesday, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we just fall more in love with you than ever before. May we grow and develop a greater love for your word than ever before. May we desire to know it because we desire to know you. Lord, I pray for those that are not here tonight that you just have your loving arms around them and just let the Holy Ghost descend upon them in a great and mighty way. Just let them feel you in a really special way. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for being here tonight, Sister Laura. I'm glad I am here. We're glad to have you. I better be in church and say it on. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> One person told me, he said, you don't need to go to church. 